About 52 years back, one Swamiji, very senior, had come here and I gave him one book containing the teachings of Sri Ramakrishna, requested him to write something on that. Then he wrote, Love God above all other things. I still remember that statement and that is the title of the subject on which I am going to speak today, maybe a couple of talks more. One of the Upanishads which has been included in the next series after the ten and upon which Bhagavan Shankara has written a beautiful commentary is the Shweta Shwatar Upanishad. It begins in a very dramatic manner. A number of rishis have gathered in a forest retreat. They are interested in finding out the ultimate cause of this universe. So they are actually discussing among themselves Brahmavadinu Vadanti. They are all Brahmavadins. They have assembled there to talk about to discuss about Brahman. Kim Karanam Brahma Kutasma Jataha Jiva Makena Kvacha Sampratishtaha Adhishthita Kena Sukheta Reshu Varta Mahe Brahma Vido Vyavastham. So they are asking one another, You knowers of Brahman. Please tell us, which is the ultimate cause of this universe, Kim Karanam? Is it Brahman? Some people say it is Brahman, some people say it is Kala, some people say it is Adrishta and so on. Kutasma Jataha, what is that source from which we have been born? Jeevama Kena, by what are we living in this world? What is it that is making us alive? Kvacha Sampratishtaha, where are we firmly established? Adhishthita Kena Sukheta Reshu Vartamahe, we sometimes feel happy, sometimes we suffer also. There must be some power which is supervising over our fate. What is that? Which is that? There seems to be some organization in this world and who is responsible for this vyavastha or perfect organization? Then they start discussing the question in greater detail Kala Swabhav Nyetir Yadricha, that is the next shloka. Some people said it is Kala, time. Some people say the 
said adrishta the unseen desert some people said there is an unseen power which is controlling the whole world and so on after discussing for quite a long time they came to the conclusion this question cannot be settled through logic and reasoning in fact there is a very interesting discussion in the brahma sutras tarka apratishthanat va that is the sutra there bhagavan shankara says tarka or logic has no permanent standing you cannot decide the ultimate truths of life by taking recourse to logic and reasoning because if somebody comes today and establishes this is the truth by defeating the others in logic after some time a more intelligent person may come and he can disprove all this and prove something else as the truth this is going on for centuries then shankara says just to tease the opponents suppose you succeed in gathering here and now all the logicians of the past present and future and if they discuss and settle something i am prepared to accept it but that's not practicable not possible so we have to depend upon what we call as shruti apta vakya the words of the rishis the great people who have realized the truth so this was practically the conclusion of these rishis also who had gathered there in order to find out the truth they just dispersed went into solitary places and started meditating upon themselves or concentrating their mind in their own hearts te dhyana yoga anugata apashyan devatma shaktim sagunair nigudham yah karanani nikhilani tani kalatma yuktani adhitishthati ekah then they took recourse to dhyana yoga deep contemplation slowly in the depths of their own being they discovered that the cause of this universe that which is responsible for creating this universe sustaining it and withdrawing it at the end of a cycle of creation is devatma shakti there is a deva there is a shakti as shri ram krishna says fire and its burning power like that brahman and kali are identical practically so devatma shakti is there there is a tremendous power and there is the supreme lord who is wielding that power and that power has got the triguna sattva rajas and tamas and by using by evolving through these gunas the whole world has come out and the supreme lord is there who is supervising who is controlling this devatma shakti so that was the conclusion of the rishis after they contemplated upon themselves in the depths of their own heart so ultimately they discovered this devatma shakti brahman and shakti or this brahman and shakti or devatma shakti or deva and shakti has got two aspects or faces one is the atman inside the other is the brahman outside but ultimately both are one and the same essential characteristic of this and that satchit ananda is one and the same that was also another conclusion of these rishis 
if that is the ultimate truth which is inside us and outside us then what is the goal of life the goal of life is to realize that and get amrutatva brahma samstho amrutatvam eti jnatva devam sarva pashapahani vedahametam tameva viditva ati mrutyu meti these are the words of the rishi sadhi upanishads they have declared that one who is well established in brahman gets amrutatva immortality moksha liberation so amrutatva immortality that is the final goal of life that can be got only by realizing the atman inside or the brahman outside ultimately there is no inside and outside once the realization comes and the upanishad has also used the word deva god the supreme now we have got two two words normally used paramatman and bhagavan paramatman is supreme atman the all pervading cosmic spirit which has no particular name no particular form it is nirguna nirakara and so on bhagavan is the entity who is endowed with six wonderful qualities so they are practically one and the same two sides of the same coin that is why another upanishad has used the word deva whether it is paramatman or brahman or atman or deva all the words practically point to the same ultimate truth of life by realizing that one gets amrutatva immortality that is half this body is given up you are not going to come back into the transmigratory existence you will be liberated permanently that is all right but how to get it how to realize it yes intellectually we have understood that the final goal of life is amrutatva and it can be got only by realizing the atman inside or brahman outside for that sadhana is necessary shri ram krishna is very particular in stressing this point he says in the gospel suppose a person wants siddhi and he goes on telling siddhi 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 he is not going to attain siddhi what is siddhi it's a kind of root one has to get that root put it in water overnight and in the early morning take it out and crush it and get the juice out of it and if you drink that juice you feel great happiness and peace it is a wonderful psychic medicine if you go on repeating the word siddhi you are not going to get that experience you have to take the trouble of preparing the juice and then take it similarly here also mere intellectual knowledge of the scriptures is not enough yes that is the first step once we have realized that we should start practicing the spiritual disciplines prescribed in the scriptures given by the great rishis the spiritual stalwarts and ultimately get the experience within ourselves in course of time the technical word used by all these philosophical systems is chitta shuddhi chitta is mind shuddhi is purification manasa eva idam aptavyam kathopanishad says this ultimate truth atman or brahman or deva has to be realized only through the mind there are some statements in the upanishads which say that atman brahman is beyond mind yato vacho nivartante aprapya manasa asaha avang manasa gocharam 
Sri Ramakrishna gives a nice explanation. It doesn't mean that we cannot realize it through the mind at all. As long as we are here in this body, it is only through the mind that we can know anything, that we can realize anything, including God. So what the scripture ultimately says is that God cannot be realized through impure mind, unrefined mind. When the mind is refined, purified, then you can know through that mind God. Sri Ramakrishna very clearly says, through the pure mind, Atman or God can be realized. That is exactly what Katha is telling here. Manasa eva idam aptavyam. This can be got only through the mind, through the purified mind, refined mind. There is another Upanishad called Amurta Bindu Upanishad. It says, Manayeva Manushyanam Karanam Bandha Moksha Yoho Bandhaya Vishya Saktam Muktyai Nirvishayam Spritam When the mind is bound by the sense organs and sense experiences, it leads to bondage, samsara. If it is freed from this bondage of Harishadvargas, then it leads to freedom. So ultimately, what is necessary is purification of mind, chitta shuddhi. The four yogas which have been given to us as the paths leading to perfection, roads to realization, they are practically the methods of purifying the mind. Mind functions in four different ways according to the Vedantic scriptures. There is the intellect, for instance, with which we are able to think and also discriminate. Then we have the feeling, emotion, Then we have the Sankalpa Shakti, I want to do this, I want to do that, make up one's mind. Then the power of concentration, memory. So in these four different ways the mind is functioning. It is possible to purify the mind by taking any one of these four aspects of the mind's functioning and through that attack the mind and purify it. That is why the four yogas have been evolved. If you take the Sankalpa Shakti and practice, it becomes Karma Yoga. If you take the memory power, it becomes Raj Yoga. If you take the intellect, it becomes Jnana Yoga. If you take the emotional aspect of the mind, it becomes Bhakti Yoga. So what is needed is to purify the mind by taking any one of these four paths. But Swamiji says, you can take to any one of these four yogas, or two or three or even all the four. Because all the four aspects of the mind are there in us, it is possible for us to practice all the four yogas, taking one yoga as the primary practice and adding the other three as subsidiary practices. Anyhow, purification of the mind ultimately leads to the realization of the Atman who is inside. And out of these four paths, the path of bhakti or devotion to God is supposed to be more suitable or very easy for the people living in this Kali Yuga. Sri Ramakrishna says, in this Kali Yuga, people are Annagata Prana. Their whole life is centered in the body which is nourished by Anna or food. Body-centered life. Therefore, 
इट इज वेरी वेरी डिफिकल्ट टू प्रैक्टिस ज्ञान योगा और राज योगा एंड अदर योगा भक्ति योगा एज टॉट बाई नारद इज द सिंपलेस्ट एंड द ईजिएस्ट पाथ सो वंस वी कम टू दिस कंक्लूजन वी कैन नाउ टेक अप द स्टडी ऑफ भक्ति योगा एंड सी हाउ इट कैन हेल्प अस इन अवर स्पिरिचुअल एवोल्यूशन ऑन भक्ति योगा वी हैव क्वेट ए लार्ज अमाउंट ऑफ लिटरेचर ए गुड नंबर ऑफ वर्क्स आर देयर विच कैन एनलाइटन एस इन दिस पाथ ऑफ भक्ति आर डिवोशन ए फ्यू ऑफ दे मे बी मैंशन नाउ वी हैव गॉट दट वंडरफुल एपिक कॉल्ड महाभारत देर इज वन सेक्शन इन दि शांति पर्व स्प्रेड ओवर नियरली ट्वेंटी एट ट्वेंटी नाइन चैप्टर्स दट इज कॉल्ड नारायणीयम दिस इज नॉट दि नारायणीयम ऑफ केरला मेलपत्तूर नारायण भट्टात्री दट इज डिफरेंट दिस इज कॉल्ड नारायणीयम इज ए पार्ट ऑफ शांति पर्व ऑफ दि महाभारत is mainly it deals with vishnu bhakti then we have of course the bhagavad gita and vishnu purana and bhagavata purana and many other puranas and coming to the sutra works the shandilya bhakti sutra and narad bhakti sutra are the two standard and well known works there is one difference between these two works Shandilya Bhakti Sutra is very terse and technical. It more or less follows the path shown by the Brahma Sutras. It's more intellectual in nature. It wants to prove that Bhakti Yoga is also a path leading to the ultimate truth through arguments by quoting the scriptures. and by trying to establish that bhakti is superior to jnana and so on but narada bhakti sutra doesn't care a fig for these arguments logic and arguments it straight away enters into the sadhana aspect and goes into it in great detail then there are other works less known than these mentioned earlier नारद पांचरात्र अहिर्बुद्ध्य संहिता एंड स्वान अफकोर्स एनी नंबर ऑफ स्त्रोत्र एंड सॉन्ग्स कंपोज बाय द ग्रेट भक्त ओवर द सेंचुरीज दे आर ऑल्सो देयर टू असिस्ट अस इन द पाथ ऑफ भक्ति बिफोर डेलविंग डीपर इन टू भक्ति योग we should know what are the basic principles which are to be known or taken for granted before we study bhakti yoga and we can study this aspect of the subject by taking recourse to sri ram krishna's teachings para brahman the supreme absolute truth is both nirakara and nirguna sakara and saguna according to shankara's advaita philosophy it is the nirakara nirguna aspect which is the truth and the highest truth the sakara saguna aspect is only a concession to the weakness of human beings but Sri Ram Krishna doesn't agree. He says, "Sakara saguna, nirakara nirguna, both are equally important. Both represent the supreme equally effectively." He gives the effect. I mean, example of water. We have got water. We have got ice. We can also add steam. there are three aspects name is different form is different 
even prayojana or utility is different, but vastu or object is one and the same. What chemistry calls as H2O. Ice has got a particular form, water doesn't. It just takes the shape of the vessel into which it is put and steam doesn't have any form at all. In the same way, God can be formless, God can be with form also. In fact, he goes to the extent of telling that God can take a form permanently and reside in such worlds as Vaikuntha and Kailasa. He says, in the North Pole and the South Pole, or near the North Pole and South Pole, there are permanent ice islands. They are there permanently, they never melt. So just like that, Kailasa and Vaikuntha can be there, and the Lord can reside there in that particular form. So, God is both Nirakara, Nirguna, Sakara and Saguna, and in whatever way you approach Him, in that way He responds. Eyathamam prabhadyante tam stathaiva bhajam yaham. Shri Krishna says in the Gita, in whichever way the devotees approach me, in the same way I also respond. There is one more point as given by the Gita. The Lord can take any form He likes, especially the human form, in order to lift the human beings up to the highest level of spiritual glory. Paritranaya, sadhunam and so on, we are familiar with it. Once I was invited by a Christian missionary institution to talk to them. About forty-five or fifty priests and nuns were there. So after the talk, one of them asked me, what is your view about conversion? Immediately I tapped the table and told them, I am for conversion. They were all very happy. Then I told them, my definition of conversion is a little different from yours. My definition is, convert a man from the brute level to the human level, ultimately to the divine level, that is the real conversion, spiritual conversion. So, this is what the Lord is supposed to do. He comes into this world taking the human form to uplift us to the highest spiritual level. Then what about the number of avatars? Is it only ten? No. Somehow in the popular mind, Dashavatara, the number ten has been fixed. But that is not correct even according to the Gita. Bhagavatam itself has listed twenty-two avatars in one place, Twenty-four avatars in another place. It is very interesting to know how Sri Ramakrishna answers these questions. In one place in the Gospel, he says, Avatara or the incarnation of God is complete and full. It is not that a small piece of God has come into this world as a human being. He gives the example, now there is the Ganga river. If you want to touch the Ganga river, it is not necessary to go and touch it from Manasarovar up to Ganga Sagar. Here and now in Dakshineshwar, you touch it, you have touched Ganga. And indirectly he is meaning himself also. If you touch his feet, it is as good as touching the God or Brahman himself. So, one has to take recourse to the worship of or meditation upon these avatars and that is very, very easy for us, the ordinary sadhakas. It is very difficult to meditate upon God in His highest form as Nirguna Nirakara. 
it is enough if you are able to choose any one of the avatars and meditate upon him in fact shandilya bhakti sutras makes this point very clear every one of the avatars is supreme god himself by meditating by worshiping that avatara aspect of avatara you are meditating upon or worshiping the supreme lord himself so this is about the philosophical background now let us see how the concept of bhakti has been growing from the earliest scriptures up to the latest there are many people who think that the concept of bhakti was actually imported into hinduism from christianity but the scholars who have examined the vedas including the rigveda they have come to the definite conclusion that the roots of devotion to god are already there even in the rigveda and more clearly in the atharvana veda in the rigveda we get quite a few mantras which are prayers addressed to the supreme god sometimes addressed as indra sometimes as marut sometimes as varuna and so on vasyam indrasime pituruta bhratu rabhunjatah mataachame chadayatah samavaso vasutvanay radhase o indra you are greater than my father then there is an interesting part here my brother probably elder brother he is not taking care of me properly you are far better than that my brother is not taking care of me properly but i have faith that you are far better than my brother so take care of me and o vasu or indra you are equal to my mother like my father you are very valuable in my life and you are equal to my mother also therefore i beg you to protect me so these elementary ideas of devotion are already there in the prayer addressed to indra of course the scholars have quoted some more mantras from the rigveda coming to the upanishads the exact word bhakti is not found in the earlier upanishads the first 10 upanishads but the idea is there though the exact word is not used the idea of devotion love of god grace of god that is already there nayamatma pravachanena labhyo na medhaya na bahuna shrutena this atman cannot be obtained by discourses by intelligence or by hearing much yame vaisha vrunute tena labhya tasyaisha atma vivrunute tanum swam he is attained by him whom he chooses in other words if the atman or the supreme self desires to reveal himself to somebody then that person automatically realizes him so we find the doctrine of grace already in this upanishad katha upanishad and mundaka upanishad if the lord chooses then he reveals himself to us shri ram krishna and holy mother very clearly say that it is in our hands to perform the sadhana but the siddhi of the sadhana lies in the hands of the lord shyam krishna gives a nice example an elephant enters into a small pool 
the whole water comes out the whole area becomes muddy and spoiled but if the same elephant enters into the ocean one doesn't even notice it not even a ripple is there then he explains it if the mind and the heart are very narrow very small then the higher spiritual experiences cannot come you cannot stand it the body will be shattered to pieces so you have to wait do sadhana purify yourself expand your heart when your mind and heart are fully ready then and then alone the lord will show himself shri ram krishna gives another example there is a king one of his servants begs him you please come to my house bless my house by your presence the king agrees but the king knows that this servant of his is not in a position to receive him properly there are no comforts no accommodation no proper arrangement so he sends all these things earlier through his other servants they go and prepare the whole ground or the field for the king to come similarly before the lord appears in our hearts he prepares our mind for that expansion of the mind of the heart increasing the devotion and faith and so on so when that comes in other words when the spiritual evolution is there those spiritual qualities have been developed to a much greater degree then automatically the lord will come reveal himself here that is exactly what this upanishad is telling us yame vaisha prunute tena labhya ha he whom the atman chooses to him he reveals himself but this shweta shweta upanishad which i quoted in the very beginning of this talk has used the word bhakti itself directly and clearly yasya deve para bhakti hi yatha deve tatha gurau tasyaite kathita hyarthaha prakashante mahatmanaha prakashante mahatmanaha that's the very last shloka of the upanishad is very interesting a person who has got great devotion to god the supreme and if he has a similar devotion towards his guru then all the truths given in the scriptures will be revealed to him so here guru bhakti and bhagavad bhakti have been practically bracketed together that is why in our scriptures the guru bhakti is stressed very greatly guru rangri padme manaschen lagnam kim tata kim tata kim tata kim every now and then we sing this song of bhagwan shankara and it is very true also of course here we take it for granted that the guru is a brahma gnani he has realized the truth one who has realized god has become one with god therefore guru and god are ultimately one and the same as far as we are concerned guru brahma guru vishnu who and so on it doesn't apply to ordinary gurus though of course we can try to see the supreme lord in them by changing our attitude with respect yasya devi para bhakti hi yatha devi tatha gurau tasyaite kathita kirtha ha prakashante mahatmanah and in the same upanishad we also find the word prapatti ar prapadye sharanagati taking refuge at the feet of the lord mumukshurvai sharanam aham prapadye i am a mumukshu desirous of getting liberation 
I have taken refuge at thy feet. Please protect me, please lift me up. So we, we see that the doctrine of bhakti or the concept of bhakti, devotion, is already there in the Vedas and in the Upanishads. But what has been given there in more or less an indir indirect form has been developed later on in great detail by the Itihasas and the Puranas, especially Ramayana and Mahabharata. Ramayana is called as Prapatti Shastra. The greatest stress is laid upon surrender to the Lord and Vibhishana Sharanagati is given as the ideal for all of us to follow. Vibhishana tried his very best to wean Ravana away from the path of Adharma. He didn't succeed. He could have just kept quiet. He didn't. He wanted to join the party of Dharma and fight against Adharma. So, he went one step farther, according to our Tyagishanji, farther than Bhishma and Drona and others. Bhishma and Drona, they tried their best to win away Duryodhana from the path of Adharma. They did succeed, but they helped him by giving some other reason. Oh, I am meeting their, his food, therefore I have to fight on his behalf. Now let us go to the very idea of bhakti. What exactly is bhakti according to the various scriptural works? Many of them have defined bhakti from different standpoints, different angles, but they all ultimately point towards one truth, intense love of God above all other things. Ananya mamata vishnu mamata prema sangata bhakti rituchyate bhishma prahlada uddhava naradaihi There are all very great devotees of the Lord. Bhishma, prahlada, uddhava and narada. They have defined bhakti in this manner. Ananya mamata, this is very important. That is, there should be no attraction towards anything else in this world. Mamata, mamatta, it belongs to me, it is mine. That feeling of emotional attachment should not be there towards any object in this world. That is the negative side. On the positive side, Vishnu, Mamata, Prema Sangata. You should feel that the Lord Vishnu, God, He belongs to me, He is mine. But that sense of mindness is Prema Sangata. It should be full of love, faith and devotion. So no attachment towards the things of the world, extreme attachment towards the Lord. Full of love, devotion and the sense of possessing the Lord. He is mine, it belongs to me. This is called bhakti according to these devotees. There is a minor Upanishad, Gopala Purvatapini Upanishad. Upanishads are great scriptures. Somehow in our tradition, the ten Upanishads upon which Shankara has written commentaries are, have been taken as the major Upanishads, the Sha Upanishad. But outside the major Upanishads, about four or five like Shweta Shwatara and others, Kaushitaki, Brahmani and others, they have also been included more or less under the group of the major Upanishads. But outside this, there are quite a good number of Upanishads. They have been classed together as minor Upanishads. In fact, their number comes to more than 200 now. They have been printed. Most of these Upanishads are much later productions and 
they practically propagate a particular sect or cult. But even then, as far as the spiritual practice side is concerned, all these Upanishads are very, very valuable. This Gopala Purvatapani Upanishad belongs to this group. It says, Bhakti hi asya bhajanam etad iha amutra upadhi nairashyena amushmin mana kalpanam. Bhakti means worshipping the Supreme Lord. Etad iha amutra upadhi nairashyena amushmin mana kalpanam. If you really want to love God, worship Him, then you will have to take, take the mind away from the ordinary things of day-to-day -day life in this world. Iha and Amutra, the objects of pleasure in this world and the objects of pleasure in the next world called Swarga, one has to take the mind away from them and concentrate that mind upon the Supreme Lord, then it can be called as Bhakti. Manogati Ravichinna Harau Prima Paripluta Abhisandhi Vinir Mukta Bhakti Vishnu Vashankari. There is a wonderful work called Narada Pancharatra. They are all famous works accepted by our tradition. Manogati Avichinna. The mind is constantly working, isn't it? It wants to go towards the objects of senses. So this manogati, movement of the mind, should be avichinna without breaks. The mind must flow continuously without breaks. But towards whom? Towards Sri Hari, not towards the world. Yes, the mind can go towards Sri Hari, but what is the attitude behind it? What is the emotion in which it has been soaked? Prema Paripruta. It has been soaked in love, supreme love of the Lord. Because this Manogati Ravichna you can find in Shishupala and Kamsa also. Constantly and continuously thinking of the Lord but out of hatred. So here he makes it very clear. It must be full of love, full of attachment towards the Lord. And Abhisandhi Vinir Mukta, there should be not even a trace of attachment towards the other things of the world. Suppose I am trying to concentrate my mind on the Lord. The mind is somehow made to flow towards the Lord. Even if there is a trace of attachment towards the things of the world, it pulls it back. If that should not happen, Abhisandhi Vinir Mukta, it should be freed from attachment to the things of the world. Then this is called Bhakti, not ordinary Bhakti, Vishnu Vashankari. Even Lord Vishnu is controlled by this. Aham Bhakta Paradhyanaha Aswatantra Yodhvija. Lord Krishna says to Durvasamuni, I am not free. I am a prisoner in the hands of these bhaktas or devotees. Surdas, a blind devotee and musician, he was traveling and he fell into a well. Did not see, could not see, fell into a well. Fortunately there was no water and he was not seriously injured. He was crying that somebody should come and lift him up. So naturally he was praying to Krishna and our mischievous boy Krishna came and then put his hand down, lifted him up and then put him on the ground. Immediately Surdas could know that it was Lord Krishna. He held his hand with all his strength. But being an old man, he could not hold it very firmly. Krishna escaped. Then Surdas tells him in one of the songs, well, well, you can go, I don't mind. But can you escape from my heart? I have imprisoned you here. You cannot escape from here. 
So that is the attitude of these devotees. Abhisandhi vinirmukta bhakti hi vishnu vashankari. Anya abhilashita shunyam jnana karmadi anavritam anukulyena krishna anushilanam bhakti hi uttama. Bhakti rasamrita sindhu. Wonderful work by Madhusudan Saraswati. Madhusudan Saraswati was a great monk of the Advaitic order, and his greatest work is Advaita Siddhi. That is practically the last word in Advaita logic. It has not been contradicted by anybody else. But at the end of that work, he writes, My mind has been captured by that blue color which is running about on the banks of the Yamuna river. This is how he puts it. So his mind is concentrated on Lord Krishna and his commentary on the Bhagavad Gita is full of devotion. Jnana Bhakti Samuchaya you can find there. So he has written a work called Bhakti Rasamrata Sindhu and this is the definition he gives. Anya abhilashita shunyam. In that mind, there is no desire for anything else. Jnana karma di anavritam. This mind has not been covered either by jnana or by karma. We are under the impression that by taking to the path of jnana or the path of karma, we are able to realize God. But according to the teachers of the Bhakti Yoga, they are useless, they won't help. Jnana karmadi anavritam anukuliyena krishna anushiranam Always following Lord Krishna according to one's own convenience and moods. So in other words, there should be no desire for anything else. You should not take the help of your own karma and jnana, and you should take refuge at the feet of Lord Krishna, and that is real bhakti. Dhrutasya bhagavad dharmat dhara vahikatam gata sarveshe manaso vrittihi bhakti ritya vidhiyate. Now here is our mind. This mind is like a solid lump. But we practice spiritual disciplines, ahimsa, satya, steya, and so on. Gradually, when this mind is purified by sadhana, it slowly melts, becomes a liquid, as it were. And after it becomes a liquid, it starts flowing. If that mind, which has been liquefied by sadhana, starts flowing with great force and power towards the Lord, sarveshe manaso vrittihi, then it is called bhakti. In other words, if you are able to think of the Lord constantly and continuously, if our mind is flowing towards the Lord, that itself is bhakti. Whether bhakti makes our mind flow towards Him, or the flow of the mind towards the Lord is called bhakti. Practically, they are two sides of the same coin. They mean the same thing. Of course, Shankara, he was a great bhakta. At the same time, he had to be a jnani also to counter the schools of Buddhist, Buddhism. So he says, Svasvarupa anusandhanam bhaktari tabhidhiyate. If the mind is turned towards the self inside and flows continuously towards the Atman inside, that is called bhakti. Ultimately, Atman and Paramatman are identical, so the mind that is flowing towards Paramatman, that itself is bhakti. But there is another very interesting definition given in the Bhagavatam. Madguna Shruti Matrena Mayi sarva gunashraye manogati ravi chinna 
यथा गंगम भसुम बुधौ लक्षण भक्ति निर्गुणस्य क्षुदाहृत मद्गुणश्रुतिमात्रेण मयि सर्वगुणाश्रिय मनोगति अविच्छिन्ना यथा गंगा भस अंबुधौ somebody is reciting the names and the glories of the lord of course here lord krishna is speaking and you hear as soon as it falls on your ears and you hear your mind melts and flows constantly and continuously towards the lord whose gunas qualities you are listening to how just like ganga flowing constantly and continuously into the ocean the ganga river flows and joins the ocean similarly the mind flows towards the lord that is called bhakti in other words bhakti is constant continuous remembrance of the lord with love with feeling with faith lot of literature is there quite a good number of aspects of sadhana are there and let us deal with all these things in greater detail in the next class